Hi everybody. In today's lecture, we're going to learn a little bit about how we can predict earthquake intensities or earthquake strong ground motions at a particular site uh, using attenuation relationships or ground motion prediction equations. So in previous lectures, we've learned a little bit about earthquakes. We've learned how we can record earthquakes. We learned that once we have a recorded earthquake, we can quantify it or try to describe it in terms of amplitude parameters, maybe like peak ground acceleration or peak ground velocity, frequency content parameters, so those might be things like Fourier amplitude or Fourier spectra or, um, or response spectra, or duration parameters, so those might be terms like uh, the bracketed duration or the maximum velocity over the peak ground acceleration. Uh, and, and so there's lots of different parameters we can use to describe a ground motion once it's recorded. But here's the challenge and the question I have for you. If we're the engineer for a particular site, how do we develop ground motions for some future earthquake that hasn't happened yet? Well, the answer, or at least one potential answer could be, is we can collect the data that um, from earthquakes that have already happened and empirically try to fit a statistical uh, or an empirical equation. And statistically fitting it, we can come up with an equation that can predict ground motions given some input that we can know beforehand before the earthquake occurs. Now, these equations then have been around for a few decades, and we call them attenuation relationships or ground motion prediction equations. If I go here to my whiteboard, let's say that you have a site and it's located right here where the star is, and you've got different faults that are located around your site and at all at various distances. Now here's the problem. You're standing right here, but you don't know where the earthquake could possibly come. The earthquake could possibly come from that fault, or it could come from this fault, or it could come from this fault, or it could come from that fault. In addition to that, um, even if you knew which fault the earthquake was going to happen on, so say maybe this fault up on the top, you don't really know how big the earthquake is going to be. Uh, and, and so yet yeah, we, we do have some problems. I mean, there's a lot of things that we don't know. But what is one thing that we do know? Well, maybe, maybe just maybe, we know the distance from our site to the fault. And we know the distance from our site to this fault. And we know the distance from our site to this fault, and we know the distance from our site to this fault. Those are all parameters that we can predict and measure beforehand. And so source to site distance, or R, is a very good uh, parameter to use in an attenuation relationship. Because it's something that we can predict before the earthquake is going to occur. And we we can predict it because we know that earthquakes happen on faults. So, with that being said, let's imagine now that uh, I have hundreds and hundreds of ground motion recordings from previous earthquakes. Now, um, from those ground motion recordings, I know uh, the source to site distance, or R, from my recording instrument to the, the seismic source or the fault that ruptured. And from each of those ground motion records, I can obtain the ground motion parameter of interest, and whatever it is. Maybe it's PGA, uh, whoops. Maybe it's PGV. Maybe it's spectral acceleration from my response spectrum. Uh, there's lots of different 
ground motion parameters that we could compute. So let's just pick one for an example, and let's just imagine that from these hundreds of ground motion recordings, I'm interested in the peak ground acceleration. And so for every recording I have, I'm going to plot the source to site distance from my ground motion recording instrument versus the corresponding peak ground acceleration in um, the recorded record. <coughs> now, I should get a plot that looks something like this, where I've got a bunch of data scattered around, and hopefully we're going to see some sort of trend in the data. The trend that we usually see is that the further away we are from the causative fault, the smaller the ground motion parameter. And this is why we call these uh, this data or, or the models we're going to develop from this data attenuation relationships because if I fit a line to it uh, that prediction line tends to attenuate the ground motion parameter with distance away from my causative fault. So um, this is great right so this is the equation then that I can use to predict what my ground motion parameter might be in this case PGA if say my source to site distance was this value right here, maybe R star. Okay, well that's fantastic. But here's the problem, right? Um, while we have this line that we can predict, we also tend to have a whole bunch of uncertainty because there's scatter about this line. All those data points don't fall right on that line. In fact, the data points tend to scatter quite a bit around the line. And so these attenuation relationships based solely on source to site distance are um, pretty scattered. And there's a lot of variability in them. And so seismologists and those who are developing these types of prediction equations began to really search for ways to minimize the this, this scatter in the data. And so the tighter that we could get the data closer to that prediction line, then the better the prediction relationship. <clears throat> but the only way that we're going to get that data closer to the prediction line is we have to add more, um, we, we have to add more independent variables into the prediction. So modern attenuation relationships today that we would, might use for design and ground motion prediction, you're typically going to produce ground motions in terms of spectral accelerations, meaning uh, they're going to produce a predicted uh, response of a single degree of freedom oscillator at, uh, that corresponds to a given period. So remember that it, this is how, where response spectra come from. So um, most of these uh, attenuation relationships also make the assumption that we have 5% damping for our uh, oscillators, but uh, the most modern attenuation relationships allow you to adjust that and will compute ground or predict ground motion parameters for different damping values. These modern attenuation relationships are much more complex than just source to site distance. They may account for the fault type, whether I have a strike slip fault or a normal fault or a reverse fault. They may account for fault geometry, so things like the dip, the width of the rupture plane, the length or the area of the rupture plane. They may account for um, uh, yeah, the dip angle, those kinds of things. Uh, whether or not our site is located on the hanging wall or the foot wall. Now this is um, going back to when we were talking about faults. If I draw just a three-dimensional representation of a fault. Okay, so this is a, a normal fault. We have extensional movement. That's my attempt at drawing an arrow. Um, going like this, so this block on the right is moving to the right and sliding down. This block on the left is moving to the left and usually staying stationary. So what's happening here is 
um, we call the block on the right the hanging wall. And we call the block on the left the foot wall. Why is that? I don't really know. I think that um, maybe it's because if I cover up the block on the right, you could kind of imagine that this block on the left kind of looks like a foot. So you can imagine like a toe right here where it gets pointy. That's my attempt to draw a foot. <laughs> So that's the foot wall. The hanging wall is a little bit easier to imagine. Um, I'm going to erase the foot wall. And lo and behold, what does that wall look like? Well, this portion of the wall looks like it's hanging or like you could hang a chandelier from it or something like that, right? So um, that's why we call it the hanging wall. And what we found is that if you're on the hanging wall, your ground motions are much higher than if you're on the foot wall. Other things, sight response effects. So sight response deals with how the local soil that's on top of the rock is amplifying, filtering, and or de-amplifying the ground motions that are being transmitted to it from the rock below. Basin effects deal with uh, whether or not you're in a basin, how deep is bedrock in the basin, and, and why this is important is that basins can cause reflections of seismic waves, and the waves just kind of can sit and bounce around and roll around and around inside of these basins, kind of like uh, what happens when you ring a bell, and the sound wave just keeps echoing and going around and around inside of a bell. Whether or not you're predicting the main shock or potential aftershocks. And, and really, at the end of the day, uh, there's many, many more, by the way. Um, these modern attenuation relationships are very difficult to perform. In fact, you're probably not going to be doing them by hand. You're going to be using some computer program or a pre-programmed spreadsheet to predict these ground motions from these relationships. And <clears throat> I'm going to upload a supplemental lecture that's going to introduce you to a spreadsheet that I provided to my students. Um, it's made available publicly by the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, or PEER, P-E-E-R, on their website. And it's the NGA West 2 uh, ground motion prediction spreadsheet. Uh, and so look for that on the Office Hours YouTube page and you can kind of just get a really brief introduction to that spreadsheet. So going back to attenuation relationships, um, if we're going to develop empirical prediction equations of ground motions, then ideally every geographic area that experiences earthquakes should have its own set of attenuation relationships. And you could ask yourself why? Well, it, it's because uh, well, let me ask you this question. Imagine if I had a ground motion recording instrument located some distance from a fault and an earthquake occurs and that instrument records ground motions from that earthquake. Now imagine a few years later that same fault produces another earthquake of the exact same magnitude. Now would I expect the two recorded ground motions from that instrument to be exactly the same? even if the two earthquakes were the exact same magnitude? Of course not. I think every reasonable person would admit that, that, that no, of course there's going to be differences between the two recorded ground motions. And so the fact is that there are a lot of other factors and parameters that affect ground motions than just source to site distance and earthquake magnitude. But if we collect ground motion data from one specific geographic area and only one specific geographic area, we in essence account for all those different variables and factors in the data set itself. And by doing that, we can potentially minimize the scatter in that ground motion data. But here's the problem. So, you know, I live in Utah. Uh, about 50 miles south of Salt Lake City. So if I wanted to predict uh, 
uh, or, or say develop a region or a, a, a uh, yeah, a region specific attenuation relationship for Salt Lake City area, I'd have a really hard time. And the reason for that is because I just don't have enough recorded earthquakes from Salt Lake City to develop these prediction equations. And so for places like Salt Lake or Charleston, South Carolina, or most of the country for that matter, um, we really have no other choice but to start combining recorded earthquake ground motions from other parts of the world where they were recorded. We need data. And so if I start combining data from all different sources into one pot, develop a model, and apply that model to some other location in the world, we call this process the ergodic assumption. The ergodic assumption meaning ground motions recorded in some other location are going to be assumed to be applicable to this location. Technically, the ergodic assumption is incorrect, but we have no other choice. I mean, what else are we going to do? So until we can record more site-specific, region-specific ground motions, we're kind of stuck with it. So which attenuation relationships do we use today? Uh, well, uh, I'd say that there's been a pretty seismic shift in the way that we predict ground motions. In the, in the last 10 years or so, uh, pardon the pun, for crustal faults in the western United States and other high to moderate seismicity areas throughout the world that are impacted by crustal faults, most professionals are currently using what are called the next generation attenuation relationships or the NGAs as, as they're more, um, uh, I don't know, as they're called affectionately by, by most professionals. Now, um, the NGA equations were, were really, really interesting and in how they came about. Whoops, wrong button. Here we go, back to the whiteboard. So you got seismologist number one who had his data set and his attenuation model developed from it. Then you have seismologist number two and she has her data set, many from the same earthquake, but just interpreted differently. And then you have seismologist number three. Maybe this one's a grumpy one. I don't know. But the point is that everybody had their own data set. And they were developing their own prediction models or attenuation relationships from their own ground motion data. And... But a lot of these ground motions were recorded from the same instruments. They were just being interpreted differently. And so what ended up happening is you had a whole bunch of um, arguments. This guy arguing with this guy and this gal arguing with this guy. And, the, and everyone was arguing and saying, mine's right, yours is wrong. And it became a mess. Well, in the early 2000s and late 90s, uh, professionals really started to address this. And they said, look, we're confused. Because at the end of the day, aren't these all the same earthquakes? Why can't we just create one universal database from which all of you can develop your own attenuation relationships? But if we use one database that everybody agrees upon, then maybe a lot of this bickering and arguments will, will go away. And that's what happened. So the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center that we, we discussed earlier, um, funded and, and and they received a lot of funding from other uh, valuable sources but they organized and administered this effort which they called the next generation attenuation relationship project or NGA project once they got a universal database of ground motions developed and vetted and agreed upon five separate research teams were given the same set of ground motion data and they were asked to develop attenuation relationships from that same data. Now, once they had the data, they could use the data in any way they wanted to. If they wanted to throw out a certain set of the data or a subset of the data, they could. They just had to be clear about it and justify why they were doing it. Um, and, and so these five different sets of um, developers were able to develop these, these updated and very modern 
attenuation relationships from this agreed upon and universal ground motion data. As soon as they finished the first round, it was called NGA West 1 project, so NGA West 1 project, um, those results were published in 2008. And then within about two to three years, the same group of individuals um, got back together, revised, grew, and augmented the ground motion database, revised their models, and released a second or an updated set of ground motion prediction equations. And they called that NGA West 2 project. That was completed in 2013, and it was published in 2014 in the journal Earthquake Spectra. And those are the attenuation relationships that most ground, uh, ground motion professionals use today in their predictions. So the different development teams that worked on the NGA West 2 project, uh, Abramson, Silva, and Kamai, Cho, and Youngs, Campbell and Buzorgnia, Bohr, Stewart, Sehan, and Atkinson, and Idris. And um, four of these five individuals used all the data, all the ground motions, whether they were recorded on rock or whether they were recorded on soil. Um, however, Idris um, decided to only focus on the subset of the data that dealt with stiff soil and rock and threw out all of the data that did not um, correspond or, or that threw out all the data that corresponded to soil or soft soil sites. And so Idris's uh, relationship should not be applied for the prediction of ground motions directly on soil sites, but only for stiff soil or rock. So I, I, li I really like this exercise. Um, number one here, this is a plot of the various earthquakes that comprise the pre-NGA I don't know why my P's are looking like R's today this is the pre-NGA database and um, I think this database was mostly from Abramson and Silva's work well, they had a model they published in 1997 and Peer kind of adopted it. Every one of these blue dots that's shown here is a recorded earthquake. You can see on the left axis the moment magnitude of the earthquake and on the, um, the x-axis below on, on the bottom the closest distance to the uh, recording instrument to the rupturing fault. Okay, then after the NGA West 1 project, this is what the database looked like. So you can see that um, the data almost doubled. They filled in a lot of different spots, like in this region, and they filled in some uh, a couple of spots up here that were very valuable, and uh, populated a lot more data down here, which was also valuable. Uh, but, you know, a big chunk of the data was right in here, which corresponded with places where we already had a bunch of data. Now, NGA West 2 looks like this. They almost tripled the data in the NGA West 2 database. And you ask yourself, holy cow, well, how did they do that? Where did all this data come from? Well, think of the, all of the significant earthquakes that occurred um, between 2008 and 2013. You had Haiti, you had Christchurch, you had earthquakes in Peru, you had earthquakes in um, Chile, you had earthquakes in Japan, lots of significant ground motion data. Now, um, granted, a lot of those earthquakes were subduction zone earthquakes. And I want to make it clear, in the NGA um, West database, there is no subduction zone ground motions in there. Okay? Only crustal fault ground motions. But because of that, I mean, look at these huge holes in the data that were filled. I mean, just all over, you know. And anyway, 
the point is, you know, we still have a bunch of holes that we need to fill. For instance, we have this big hole right there. We could use more data up here. We could use data down here, data over here. I mean, so there's holes that we still need to collect and we're shooting for. But we have a pretty good representation in this big block right here. So if we're going to use the NGA relationships, um, the NGA equations use a lot of different metrics to define distance. And um, the metrics that they use, for instance, there's Rx, there's Rjb, there's Rup. I think those are the only three. But uh, I want to teach you about all of these different um, distances so you can use these prediction equations effectively. Um, the first one is that we're going to talk about is Rx. So Rx is the closest horizontal distance to the extension of the top of the rupture. I want to make that clear. To the extension of the top of the rupture. Now if you're on the hanging wall, Rx is going to be a positive value and it's in units of kilometers. If you're on the foot wall, then Rx is going to be a negative value. So let me show you what this uh, might look like, for instance. So let's say, um, let me see if I can come up with a good representation here. Okay, so let's say I have a fault that ruptures like this, and I'm looking down on plan view. This is the foot wall. This is the hanging wall. Now, and let's imagine that this fault rupture is right at the ground surface. So this line that you're seeing is actually the top of rupture, and we're looking straight down at it. So let's say that I have a site located right here. How would I get Rx? Well, I would extend the strike of the fault. But Dr. Frankie, the fault doesn't extend that far. Yeah, I know, but I want you to just extend it. Okay, then, the distance from your site to that extension, it's got to be a 90 degree angle, that is going to be Rx. And Rx, if you're on the hanging wall, is going to be greater than zero. It's going to be positive. Now what if your site happened to be on the foot wall, like up here? Well, then it's going to be the distance from, you know, same thing going orthogonally from the extension to your site, it's going to be Rx, but this time it's going to be a negative number. Okay, So that's your Rx source to site distance. And remember, these are horizontal distances. Okay, Now let's teach you what Rjb is. Rjb, I want to give you the, um, right here we call it the board joiner distance, and that's not going to help you. So. Oops. So let's imagine here that um, looking in plan view that my fault ruptured down to a uh, I'm going to draw a little three-dimensional view here of my fault. Let's see here, 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 here here, here, okay, so again, this is the foot wall, this is the hanging wall, Now let's imagine that this section of fault ruptured. That's my depth of my fault rupture. So you could imagine extending this all the way across to the end of the fault. 
So if I were to just shade out my rupture plane, that's kind of what it would look like, right? Okay, now imagine if I were to project that rupture surface onto the ground surface above. So just project it. Whoops, I went too far. Here's the bottom of rupture, project it up to the ground surface. Okay, you gotta remember, this is my ground surface. Here's my fault rupture. I'm gonna project it up to the ground surface. Okay, so that projection would shade this much of the ground surface, right? On that surface projection of the rupture zone projected on the ground surface. Now, imagine an eyeball looking straight down. That's what we're looking at up here. So imagine now this is my surface projection of, well, actually, it's got to be the whole fall, the fall rupture. So here's my surface projection of the rupture zone looking straight down. Got that? Okay. RJB is simply the horizontal distance. Well, let's say my site was right here. Say my site was right there. RJB is the horizontal distance, the closest horizontal distance to this projection of the surface rupture. Okay, that distance right there, that's RJB. Or what if my site happened to be on the foot wall right here? Well, then that distance right there is RJB. What would happen if my site happened to be right there and the fault rupture was directly beneath my feet? Well, that's the case, then RJB is simply going to equal zero. Okay, that's RJB. So if you look at these pictures here, um, you can see if this is my site, here's my top of rupture, extend the top of rupture right up there. So uh, because there's no dip angle in this fault, my rupture surface if projected to the ground is just this little zone of red that I'm shading right there. So that's why RJB is equal to RX in this particular case. And RX is positive because um, we're, we can say we're on the hanging wall. For a strike slip fault it doesn't matter if RX is positive or negative because you don't know which one is the hanging wall or the foot wall. But if we do have a dip Okay, so again, uh, here on the figure on the right, I have a, a fault that has a dip. Here's my surface projection. So this zone right here is my surface projection of the fault rupture. So RJB is simply the horizontal distance or the closest distance to that surface projection. And RX is the distance from my site to the projection of the top of the rupture. Even if the fault doesn't extend to the ground surface, yeah, even if the fault doesn't extend to the ground surface, you still project the top of the fault up to the ground surface. Let's see, um, we wanted to talk about
rup our rupture yep okay our rupture shown right here this would be the um, closest distance from the site to the actual rupturing plane so this is the closest distance to the rupturing fault plane so in both of these cases you just um, take your site and you go straight down the the shortest distance to the fault plane itself if I'm looking on this figure right here okay if my site was located right here on the ground surface it would be coming straight down to the fault such that it would make um, it would come off 90 degrees from the fault plane and that distance would be our up okay so you kind of have to think of the fault three-dimensionally. So our RUP is going to account for and help you, um, well, it's going to account for the dip angle of the fault and, and, and where the site is located relative to the rupturing fault. Now there's, there's one other um, R distance I forgot to talk about. So let's see, we covered RX, we covered RJB, we covered our RUP, but I forgot that the NGA West 2 attenuation relationships also have a new distance called R Y naught. And R Y naught is um, it's pretty easy. So we have our surface projection of the fault right here. Now imagine um, projecting this line out in the direction of the dip. And we could do it on this side as well. R Y is simply the horizontal distance from that projection okay so R Y naught that deals with um, the distance to the surface projection can't spell today projection in the direction of the strike and RJB deals with the distance to the surface projection in the direction of the dip so what if my site was located between these two points what if my site was located right here okay well if that's the case um, this distance right here would be RJB and RY naught would equal zero because I'm already between these two dotted lines that extend in the direction of the dip. What if my site was located, I don't know, up here? Okay. Well, if um, that is the case, I'm going to have to um, double check on this. Let me, I'm going to pull up this spreadsheet really quickly. And just double check here. Here's our formal definitions closest distance here's RJB closest distance to surface projection of co-seismic rupture see figures A B and C for illustration yeah okay that's what I thought so if this is your site RJB is going to be this distance right here 
r y naught is going to be this distance right here. So it's going to take a little bit of getting used to for you because this is the first time you're hearing it. But once you practice with it a little bit, uh, you, you'll get it down. Okay, let's go back. Okay, now how do the uh, NGA attenuation relationships do when you're dealing with soil versus rock? Well, the NGA relationships, they, they really don't have a trigger for soil or rock anymore. The old attenuation relationships used to. I mean, they were completely separate relationships. You either had soil or you had rock. Well, now um, we just use an input value called the VS30. VS30 is the average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters of the ground. And it's computed with a harmonic mean uh, in those upper 30 meters. And it's all weighted based on the thickness of the soil layers. So, uh, what we've developed is, are these kind of generalized classifications, meaning if my VS30, meaning the average shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters of the soil, is greater than about 1500 meters per second, we definitely have hard rock. And if we have hard rock, then the codes that we use today generally call these conditions a site class A. If I have a shear wave velocity between 760 and 1500 meters per second, that's firm rock and we call that a site class B. If it's between 360 and 760 meters per second, that's soft rock, site class C. Uh, and then 180 to 360 is what we call regular soil. That's a site class D and that constitutes the majority of soil sites. Uh, but if I have a shear wave velocity that's less than 180 meters per second in the upper 30 meters of the ground, then we call that soft soil and that's a site class E. Now the NGA relationships, all you do folks, is you're just gonna plug in the value of VS30 that you have at your site. It's an input into the relationships. What about subduction zones? I mean, what do we do if we wanna predict ground motions for a subduction zone earthquake, either an intraplate or an interplate event? Um, you know, the subduction zone sources are different animals. They produce different ground motions that have crazy long durations and can have very large amplitudes depending on your location relative to the, um, the, the source. And so they kind of have their own signature and they should be treated differently than crustal fault sources. So what I'm trying to say is, if you're trying to model a subduction zone event, do not, do not use the NGA attenuation relationships for those subduction zone sources. Uh, there's a couple of attenuation relationships that are out there that you could use, like uh, Young's et al., Atkinson and Bohr 2003, and Zhao et al., 2006. And there is currently undergoing um, uh, an NGA subduction zone project. And the reason that project is underway is because we, re we recorded so many ground motions from subduction zone events um, between 2008 and now. We had Peru, we had Chile, and we had Tohoku. And all of these earthquakes were more than triple, probably more than quadrupled, the number of recorded ground motions we had from subduction zone events. What if, though, you're in an area that is not considered a high or a moderate seismicity area? Like maybe you're in the central or the eastern part of the United States. These are what we call continental seismic sources. So they're, they're considered stable, not known to be highly seismic. Okay, The 2008 and 2013 NGA equations were not developed for these types of sources. So uh, in essence, to model these types of sources, currently it's a complicated process.
we represent these sources usually like like the U, the US Geological Survey will represent these sources with a whole weighted average hodgepodge from like nine different attenuation relationships <coughs> bless me each um, developed specifically for continental seismic sources the problem with each one of these relationships folks is that they're based on little data so why can't we just use the ground motion prediction models from the high seismicity areas dr frankie well the reason for that is ground motions attenuate differently in fractured rock like in high seismic areas than they do in solid rock like in low seismicity areas the ground motions that you would predict from the ngas are completely different than the ground motions you would actually see in the continent these continental regions okay what about older oh wait 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 one last thing i want to say um there is another nga project going on um nga central uh, United States project it was supposed to have wrapped up like three years ago uh, but they keep extending it uh, I'm guessing that they're continuing to vet the ground motions but it's going to be great when those models come out because all of this hodgepodge is going to go away and it's going to be replaced with a few number of attenuation relationships that are, are all developed from data that you know the majority of scientists agree upon so we can't wait for those to come out okay so what do we do with older attenuation relationships like the you know the relationships from the 90s or the 80s and there's a whole bunch of these relationships that are presented in section 3.4 of your Kramer textbook so what do I want you to do with those I want you to memorize them just kidding I, I bet I stopped your heart there for a second. No, I don't really care about those relationships and I, and I don't really want you to care either. But they're, they're nice for you to know that they're there. And they still can be valuable because they're easy to use. They're just little equations usually. And you know what? Those equations are still kicking. I mean, you can put in data and still get a reasonable predicted ground motion. And so they can be used to check your answers to you know like for gut checks to make sure that the answers you're getting from other attenuation models make sense and so they can be useful for like back of the envelope type calculations okay so that's the end of this lecture i appreciate your attention uh, be sure to look for the supplemental lecture that i talked about uh, where i'm going to introduce the nga spreadsheet the nga west 2 spreadsheet i, I kind of gave you a peek at it in this lecture here um, and that lecture won't be very long, but I just want to do a demonstration with the spreadsheet so you can see how it works. With that, thanks for your time and have a wonderful day.